are on round yeah, three. Yes, yeah, on. Action. So we are on our third chapter for the day, which is going to be our last chapter that we'll cover. Uh, chapter seven, just to let you know, I will be omitting some slides uh, with this chapter. There's a large bulk of this chapter that goes into way too much genetics okay, that, that we want to uh, go into for this particular class. It's a boy chapter. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is definitely go over just obviously a lot of the etiology type risk factor things. Um, we will touch a little bit on pathogenesis, but definitely go into more signs and symptoms and treatment and things like that with cancer. Um, cancer does affect a lot of different areas of the body, um, especially not only the disease itself, but also sometimes cancer treatment. Okay, we'll go into that. Okay, so with chapter seven, uh, with neoplasia, um, neo meaning new, plasia meaning growth. So in <laughs> this is a terrible video. I'm so bad. I'm falling. The clicker's falling out of my hand. Okay. So neoplasia, um, neo meaning new, plasia meaning growth. So last uh, chapter we looked at hyperplasia, okay, increased growth. This meaning new growth. As we know, when we talk about neoplasia, um, this is definitely talking about, obviously, cancer cells. And what happens here, this is an abnormal uh, situation where there is an abnormal growth that occurs with abnormal cells. Uh, cancer cells, as we know, does come from what, we, what is considered an altered gene expression. Uh, some scientists do believe that we all have a cancer cell inside of us, which honestly is true, because it's just a matter of if that normal cell is going to have an altered gene expression and convert itself into a cancer. So we will go over in detail um, the difference between a malignant and benign tumors. Uh, malignant uh, cancers definitely are more obviously uh, more of the bad diagnosis and more aggressive, whereas benign tumors are usually easily cured and more along the not <coughs> excuse me not so bad diagnosis. Okay. So first, let's talk about malignant tumors. Um, one thing before I get started, I want to just show you in your book, if you don't mind, I'll just open up your book here. On page one, for those of you who have the new book, um, on page 114 and 115, there are two tables that I want you guys to uh, look at. And for those of you who have the old edition, I'm not sure what pages it is, but if you open up chapter seven, it's actually 7-1 and 7-2. Okay, so table 7-1 and 7-2. Now those two tables, please make sure you study those tables at home, okay, because I will give you some questions from those two tables. Table 7-1 goes over the characteristics of the difference between benign and malignant tumors, okay, so some of them we'll go over now. So just make sure that you review that, and then I'll go over 7-2 in a second. Okay, do you have it in the old book? You have it? Okay. 130 and 131. What is it? 130 and 131. Okay, 130 and 131 for those of you who have the old edition. Now, <clears throat> for malignant tumors, malignant tumors, um, the situation here is that they do have a chance to be invasive and also to metastasize. One thing that you should know, which talks about with this uh, table 7 1, one thing about tumor growth. In order for anything to grow, just like any type of tissue in the body, it needs vascular supply. So what happens here is when we talk about benign tumors, benign tumors do not have a high vascular supply, but malignant tumors do. Hence the reason why malignant tumors can grow larger uh, in size, and not only that, but they can also uh, allow, by having more um, vascular channels, allow for this type of cancer to spread. Okay. Now, another thing that you should note is that there's two ways cancer will spread. It will spread through blood, and it will also spread through lymph. 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 No, Say it right. Lymph. Lymph. Can you just repeat that? Lymph. Sorry. Yes. Two ways cancer can spread is through one way is through blood, and the other way is through lymph, lymphatic tissue, or lymph nodes, or lymph channels. <clears throat> Okay, so as we know, say for example, a person that may have, uh, just give an example, lung cancer, 
and then all of a sudden there is obviously a lot of blood channels and vascularity around that tumor now opening up the gateway for the fact that these cells can now just kind of go through the bloodstream and then hence the reason why sometimes people can get a metastasis to a bone or something like that okay so this is how that works now another differentiation i would say between benign and malignant um, and i wish i had that board with me let's take the example of skin cancer okay so say for example a person may have a little lesion okay on their skin and they're not quite sure what's going on with it there are some things that go towards more of a benign and there are some characteristics that go more towards a malignancy so say for example they have a little lesion on their skin and what is one thing that you know just common knowledge that you would look for with this type of lesion Okay, discoloration, very good, size, bleeding, size. yes, the if it's bleeding. Size, the outside of it. The outside, so we want to look at borders. Okay, so let's just stop there. we got a lot. So color. <laughs> <laughs> color, definitely if there's color change. Um, anytime that there's color change, that usually is not a good sign. Okay, sometimes it usually go more towards a malignancy, especially with skin cancer. Another thing that you talked about was borders. Borders are extremely important because sometimes if you were to feel the actual uh, nodule, and if you can just kind of run your fingers over it and feel where it starts and stops, that's a good sign. But if you kind of feel it and it's sort of jagged and you don't know where the actual um, edges are, that tells us that the extensions are actually protruding, okay, and they, they may be fixated somewhere. So you want to make sure that it's well-defined, okay, a well-defined type of lesion is actually a little better of a prognosis so to speak now another thing too is sometimes if you're feeling nodules or, or lesions like that you want to see if it's mobile or fixated so if it's mobile mobile usually is a good sign that it's okay it's moving around usually if it's fixated that tells us that this particular lesion now has kind of like what I call arms or like extensions, meaning that now it has fixated itself to the surrounding tissue, okay? Which is not a good sign, which means it has probably definitely had some vascular channels, okay, that made that happen. So that's just an example just to give you some of the characteristics between benign and malignant. And some of that is also in the chart in your book, okay? Now, let me go back to the slide here. What happens with malignant tumors, um, they do say that they have a tissue-specific differentiation, which means that they do not resemble the tissue origin. So remember I showed you the picture in the previous chapter about dysplasia and how the cells just look disorderly and you can't tell what it is? This is a situation that goes on with malignancies. So what will happen is you'll see an area of cells that just you can't define exactly what it is. It doesn't even look like the tissue type, even though we're looking at lung tissue, and we know that lung tissue is supposed to look like squamous cells or whatever it is, and you can't tell what it is. So that is definitely one characteristic, which is also listed in your table. Tumors do grow rapidly, and again, that is malignant tumors grow rapidly again, and that's because of the vascular supply that is there. And we took a look at that picture already, that cervical dysplasia. Okay. Now, benign tumors. With benign tumors, they do not have the potential to kill the host, but they can be life-threatening because of its location. Okay, so saying that, um, perfect example, I had a patient that had a lipoma. And so she had this lipoma right on the posterior portion of her shoulder. She had it, it wasn't a big deal. All of a sudden, this lipoma started getting larger. And then what happened was it was restricting her range of motion. So in that situation, she had to have it removed. And usually with lipomas, if you've never seen them before, heard of them, they're just little fatty cysts, okay, that kind of stick out from the dermis of the skin. And what happens is that um, sometimes when patients have lipomas, if they have one, it's a possibility they may get another one somewhere else in their body. Um, they're quite common, and they're usually benign little cysts, not a big deal. But sometimes you can have these benign cysts that can be in certain places or areas of the body that can cause issues, okay? Not saying that it's cancerous and we need to take it out, but just because of its location, you have to remove it. Um, benign tumors, we don't have to worry about as much as it's spreading, okay, like a malignant tumor because it does not have the uh, vascular supply and so forth. And then also when we talk about many of the benign tumors are encapsulated. 
So remember how I said that if you feel it and you can feel that it's uh, circular pretty much, or not so much circular, but just well-defined, and that also that it's mobile. This is what we mean by encapsulated, meaning that that particular tumor is contained. Um, so it does not mean that that tumor has probably extended into maybe the neighboring tissue space like a malignant tumor. <coughs> okay, and again, little vascularity. Now, the next thing I need to go over with you, which um, goes into the next table, which is table 7-2. That table 7-2, uh, I know it's a lot, don't get nervous, okay? Um, but what I want you to look at that table is if you want to memorize it, memorize it. If not, but there's a, something called nomenclature. So you should be able to look at the name of a cancer and, and just by looking at the name, know that it's benign and malignant, okay? And so we're going to go over how to break down that nomenclature. Um, keep in mind that for next week's quiz, what's going to happen is I'm going to have kind of like a case study type question. And I'm going to do a review before we leave today, so don't worry. But I will have a cancer question on the exam. And we haven't gone over that particular cancer. But just from knowing, knowing the nomenclature and knowing how benign and malignant tumors behave, you should be able to answer the series of questions that follow it. Okay. So this is how we're going to do it. Now, OMA is a term that's usually uh, have a, suff is a suffix that usually follows behind uh, the actual tissue or the tissue origin, which usually goes along with most of our benign tumors. So, say for example, as I told you, lipoma. Okay, so light lipo for t fatty tissue. Okay, or adipose tissue, if you want to say uh, OMA, meaning benign. So, lipoma is just a benign fatty tumor, cyst tissue, whatever you want to call it. Uh, carcinoma and sarcoma, these suffixes are used for malignant tumors. Okay, so please make sure you know carcinoma and sarcoma, I'm quite sure you've heard of some of those. Uh, carcinoma is going to be a malignant tumor of epithelial origin. So say for example, if you've heard of uh, basal cell carcinoma, okay, so that's definitely telling us the epithelial origin basal cell and carcinoma, you would only use carcinoma for something that has an epithelial type origin. When you use sarcoma, sarcoma, that suffix is only used for things that are a mesochymal origin, such as maybe a bone, tissue, okay, or um, uh, bone, ligaments, things of that nature. So very good example of that would be osteosarcoma, chondral sarcoma, okay. So these are things that will be used for that, um, that nomenclature is used for that um, type of origin. Leukemias, we already know that's malignancy of the white blood cells. And we will do an entire chapter next week on leukemias, which is chapter 11. It's chapter 11. Now, just a little background about cancer. Okay, we'll just kind of go into some of the risk factors and so forth. Uh, second leading cause of death in the U.S. What's the first leading cause of death? Heart disease. Heart disease, very good. Cardiovascular disease is the number one leading cause of death, uh, which is sad because most of this is, could be prevented. Okay. Um, most cancer deaths occur in individuals, they say over 55. They give you the incidence there of men and women and the survival rates. Okay. This diagram shows you the um, types of cancers and A, the portion A goes over the number of diagnosis of cancers or the percentage of diagnosis of cancers, whereas section B goes over the number of deaths. Now, what I want to point out to you is that prostate, breast, and lung are the top three for the top three diagnosis and top three cancer deaths. And colorectal doesn't fall far from that. Okay, prostate and then colorectal. Um, one third of cancer deaths um, can be attributed to lifestyle factors. So some of these things we do already know. Tobacco use. Okay, so we can talk about smoking, and we'll talk about it again. Okay, nutrition. There are some nutritional factors that um, do they feel kind of play a part with people getting cancer. Obesity, sun exposure, obviously for skin cancer. Um, sexual exposure, HPV, and I just want to make an addition to this. Um, they say HPV, cervical cancer. Yes, there's a large percentage of HPV for cervical cancer, but they are, 
there are studies that are out showing that HPV is now leading into oral cancer, okay, in men. Okay, so men are also getting oral cancer. Uh, leave that to your imagination. <laughs> this is this is from sexual exposure. Okay, but it is it is true. Okay, so it's not just cervical cancer. Okay. Now, tobacco. Now, when people talk about uh, smoking, okay, so anytime people say, "Oh, they're smoking," and the first thing you think about is lung cancer. Uh, please keep in mind that smoking, yes, can increase the chances of someone having lung cancer, but they can also develop other types of cancer as well. So please make sure you know that it is smoking has also been linked to pancreatic, kidney, bladder, mouth, esophageal, and cervical cancer, okay, just from smoking, so not just lung. Um, I'll tell you the story. One chiropractor that I used to work with uh, when I was living in New Jersey, he uh, used to smoke for years and years and years. He actually started to develop, he always had a chronic cough. He developed emphysema, unfortunately, because he was definitely one of those chronic smokers. So to see him go into a COPD is not shocking, okay, because he was smoking for, I would say, over 20 years. Um, the other thing here is that once he developed emphysema, unfortunately, he got a diagnosis of throat cancer, okay, and then after that diagnosis, he did um, unfortunately die two years after that diagnosis. And um, the crazy thing was, um, when I went to the funeral, and after we leaving the church, and we're outside, and what do you think his wife is doing? Smoking. <laughs> so, you know, smoking is one of those things, and I, um, I've never had that issue. I don't, I don't smoke, but I, from what I hear, it is a bad habit, um, that, and it's hard to kick. Um, but I think you just have to be mentally ready to do it. And then some people, you see things, but you just don't think it's going to happen to you. So in any event, those are the different types of cancers. Um, this graph here, you really can't see that much, but it's just going over the types of cancer, so I'm not too concerned about that. Now, yes? I'm sorry, I'm um, going back to the tobacco use. Yes. Um, so that was, that was um, for smoking. What about people that, that chew? Um, I don't know about chewing. I think it's the actual smoke. I, I don't okay. know about, because most of the studies are from the smoking, the lighting, okay. uh, the burning of the tobacco. Right. Chewing it, could it cause issues? Possibly. I don't know if it has as the, the same number of carcinogens uh -huh. as if you were to light it. Um, unless, and I'm glad you said that, because tobacco use, tobacco in general, anything that's tobacco form, so if you're smoking something else, I don't think that <laughs> falls under that category, uh, just to let you know. Uh, I don't think it falls under that category, but it's the tobacco. That's the issue. Okay, so I just wanted to clear that up. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so with the tobacco, tobacco actually has two types of carcinogens. Um, it is the initiator, which causes genetic damage, and the promoter which actually causes tumor growth. So this is a double whammy here, okay? And this is why uh, the whole anti-smoking and campaigns is such a big, and you know how they have those smoking commercials to try to scare you half to death, okay? Um, now, it is an important thing because it is known to produce these carcinogens, okay? And this has been tested and it's the truth. Um, also, secondhand smoke. One of my uh, students, I think it was about three or four terms ago, she did her um, presentation on lung cancer, and it was about her grandmother. Her grandmother developed lung cancer and unfortunately passed away. And so what happened was her grandmother never touched a cigarette a day in her life. And what happened was she was married to her husband for over 30 years or more, and he smoked pretty much throughout their whole marriage and the whole time they were together. So she developed lung cancer from his secondhand smoke. So, this is a very serious uh, situation, and they do say that it is known that secondhand smoke does have known, I think I have the exact number, I think it's like 6,000 or 8,000 carcinogens um, in secondhand smoke. But there is a large percentage of carcinogens from secondhand smoke that uh, just as much as first hand. Okay. So extremely important to know. Just some more stats. Okay. Without attributing to smoking lung, yes, you know. Okay. Now, 
with nutritional factors, um, and let me just make sure I'll give you the right thing, yes. With nutritional factors, they do believe that there are some nutritional or dietary uh, lifestyles that do contribute to certain cancers, okay? Fat. A person that has a diet that's high in fat, they do contribute this to breast cancer. Okay, so a person that has a diet that's high in fat, they do contribute this to breast cancer. Fiber. Fiber, patients that have a diet that's low in fiber, they do contribute this to colorectal oh. cancer. Okay. To what? Colorectal, colorectal cancer. Now, just to let you know, I did read something, and I think they're doing some studies also that um, they are kind of linking smoked meats to people obtaining colorectal cancer, too. So, like cured meats, uh, like smoked turkey, and smoke, whatever, whatever smoked. Okay, so those smoked meats that go on the smokehouse, okay, those types of meats, um, and not to say grilled meats, but things that go in a smokehouse, that's a whole different way of curing meat. Um, they are linking that to colorectal cancer. Um, alcohol. Alcohol um, can be linked to uh, definitely liver cancer. Let me just make sure I get this correct. Liver cancer. Um, breast cancer, esophageal, and liver cancer. Okay, so alcohol. Increased amounts of alcohol can be linked to breast cancer, esophageal cancer, and liver cancer. And then they have here antioxidants, even though it's not contributing to cancer, but antioxidants are actually supposed to be um, the situation that's supposed to control some of the free radical production that can happen with um, this whole genetic or gene expression, or altered gene expression. So what happens here is that they say that if a person has high levels of antioxidants, it's supposed to reduce that um, amount of the gene expression, altered gene expression process. And antioxidants, as you know, I believe um, a lot of different foods, pomegranates, um, say blueberries, all everything. Um, there's a lot of different things in it. antioxidants. Big marketing tool as well. Now, this is where we're going to start cutting out. Okay. So, we're going to stop at 14. And we're going to pick back up. So you're cutting out 14. And we're going to pick back up at slide 44. Oh, boy. I know that's a lot. We are not complaining. X, X. And please keep in mind, I don't want you to think, I don't want anybody to feel cheated, okay, or anything like that. Um, oh, no, no, no. No, 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 seriously. This is what, the point here is that when we go, if I was to go over all of this, this is way, it's a lot of genetics, okay, than what we need for this class. Um, and if you would look at something like that, okay. I don't think anybody would want that on the test. I would even want that on my test. No. Uh, no. So, you know, it's way, way into too much genetics. So, you know, keep in mind that the publisher, they make this book, you know, for everything. It's like a microphone. You have to make it heavy for all that stuff. I just want to explain that because I don't want people to know oh, she's cutting out all the information. No, that's not information that is that extremely helpful for you. Oh, okay, so you don't want to do it on your own? No. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, um, but I'm not going <laughs> to. You're never cheating by taking information wait, wait. off a test. Wait, you're on video. Okay. Wait. <laughs> um, no, what I'm trying to say is if you want to read the information, just if you want to get more understanding, that's fine um, with me, but I'm not going to test you on it. Like I said, it goes into a lot of genetics. Okay. Um, honestly, I'm, a, I'm not that strong in genetics um, in that area, but it's too much genetics that we need to know for pathophysiology for this, okay, for cancer. So we don't need to get into that. So I'll explain. I believe you. Okay. So the next thing we're going to continue on with is metastasis, okay? 
So we already talked about how sometimes malignant tumors can lead into a metastasis and now spread into different sites. So we're now going to break down the physiology of how this metastasis occurs. Now, metastasis, um, this is a process, as they say, which cancer cells do escape the tissues and they can spread to different sites. Now, they do have specialized enzymes and receptors that do allow them to um, leave their original tissue and metastasize to another site. So, what do we mean by that? If you look at this next diagram, I'm sorry, this is a little tiny, but what they're showing you here is that this cancer cell is now leaving its original tissue type, well, it has left, excuse me, its original tissue type, and it's now sitting on the surface of another tissue type or another organ. And so what happens is that they're showing you here that they do have receptors on the end here and enzymes pretty much like, um, you know how with fertilization, okay, and how the, the um, acrosome, okay, is there to pretty much uh, take the coating away from the egg and so the sperm can get inside. This is the same sort of process. So what happens here is that this enzyme that is being released from that cancer cell will sort of break that coating, or not so much a coating, but it will now break the, be able to break the cell membrane and the tissue to go inside that particular tissue and now invade and now cause a metastasis site. Okay, so this is what happens here. Um, now, patterns of the way it spread, okay, this is extremely, extremely important to know. Um, what happens here, as I told you before, cancer cells do spread via blood and lymph, so they have your circulatory and lymphatic systems. Tumor markers are very important and they help identify the tissue origin. So, something that you should know, and some of you guys may know this already, you know when people do have certain types of cancer, so say for example prostate cancer, we know has a testing of the PSA. So you can see that um, specific antigen that is released from that tissue origin. So say, for example, if a person has a prostate cancer and that prostate cancer metastasized to, uh, let's say, the pancreas, for, for example, what will happen is when the blood work is done, the body knows, and this is pretty amazing, the body knows to release a tumor marker or that particular antigen for the original cancer site. Okay, so it's not going to release a tumor marker for the pancreas. It'll release a tumor marker for the original site. So you will always know the original cancer. Okay, so that's important to know. Keep in mind that when tumor markers, um, they're pretty much either antigens or sometimes enzymes that are released from the original cancer um, tumor itself. And what will happen is this will definitely flow through the bloodstream and it can be tested during blood work. Um, the other thing here is that they can also be identified sometimes through biopsy as well. But sometimes, as you know, and in your book, um, this is one thing they changed, honestly, from the old book to the new book. The old book actually was more detailed with the tumor markers, and I used to test the students on the tumor markers, but the new book took some of them out, and they condensed it for some reason. And um, so right now, I'm just going to leave it out for, for right now. But um, just to let you know, there are certain tumor markers that are present in certain types of cancers, okay, as you know. And I believe there is a chart. For those of you who have the old book, you'll see the chart that's there, and it's more uh, detailed. So that's that. And the other thing, too, is it will help um, track tumor activity. And what do we mean by this? We mean that what happens here is that if we know, say, for example, a person has a pancreatic cancer, um, just from blood work or, you know, just from their exam. Or if we know a person has a prostate cancer. We know just from uh, ex understand experience, but just knowledge that some of these cancers behave a certain way. So then you know, if you know, if you know the origin of the cancer, you know how to treat it and pretty much how it's going to behave. Okay, so this is extremely important, knowing the tumor markers, because it gives you a lot of clues um, in treatment. Now, the other thing here is angiogenesis. Okay, so we said before that keep in mind that tumors do need vascular supply, and this is what allows them to feed, okay, and get larger. And so what happens here, angiogenesis is when we have a formation of vascular supply around that tumor. Okay, so angiogenesis is the formation of blood vessels. So when we get those blood vessel formation around the tumor, 
this now allows blood supply and feeds it and makes it grow and just like any other healthy tissue in the body, even though this is not healthy. Now keep in mind that when we talk about, um, say for example, um, radiation therapy, radiation therapy in cancer is used to try to decrease the uh, process of angiogenesis. So the radiation is targeted to pretty much try to kill off the vascular supply that's around that tumor. So that's one way of, of getting rid of it. Um, grading and staging, just to let you know, so there are two things once a person is diagnosed with a particular cancer or which, which will help let you know what stage they're at. Okay. So just to let you know, grading is what we consider the histology portion of recognizing what type of cancer it is, okay? So grading is going to be the histology portion. So this means that this tissue had been biopsy, okay, by this time it is prepped, the pathologist is looking at it, and under this slide they can look at the degree of dysplasia or anaplasia, okay? Anaplasia just means a higher degree of dysplasia. So at this point, the pathologist will be able to say, okay, well, it's a stage three or four or whatever it is, okay? So this is what we talk about with grading. Um, <clears throat> staging is going to be pretty much uh, looking at the actual tumor itself. So not so much the cell, but looking at the tumor itself as far as the tumor growth. Has it invaded any neighboring tissues? Okay. Um, so what happens here is they look at the location, the patterns of spread within the host. So say for example if a person has breast cancer, Okay, and sometimes breast cancer can sort of metastasize and go to the axillary lymph nodes because that's the closest channel there. So it can spread through the lymph channel that way. So they're looking at things like that. Um, tumor size, growth, distant metastasis, and just to let you know, TNM, um, let me tell you what this stands for. T stands for tumor. T stands for tumor. N stands for lymph node and the M stands for metastasis. Okay, so I'll repeat. T stands for tumor, the N stands for lymph node, and the M stands for metastasis. Okay, so what is the reason for that? This tells us that tumor, if a person just has a single tumor, or has this tumor now spread to the lymph node, or now has this tumor not even spread to the lymph node, but now has it metastasized to a whole other organ. So this is how they stage it, okay? So is it at a stage one, let's say tumor, just stage one, lymph node now involvement of two, three, or four, more like a metastasis nature, okay? So this is how they do that. Um, and obviously knowing grading and staging has a big, um, is extremely important as you can imagine with knowing how to treat this person. Okay. So say for example, and we'll talk about this next week, if a person has, um, say, a lymphoma, and they have just one little single lymphoma, okay, one little single lymph node, um, do they need chemo and, 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 and everything else? No. They could just do radiation just to that singular lymph node. But if they have a hole now spread through the lymphatic chain, yes, now you need more extensive treatments such as maybe chemotherapy, okay, and radiation. Okay, so this helps uh, out with treatment. Now, what they're showing you a picture here is um, something called, I believe this is a PET scan. Um, and what happens here is that they will inject the patients with sort of like a, a radioactive type of dye. And what happens here with this